Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today to the second quarter of Amplify Baltimore. Are you guys amped? Yeah. I'm not so convinced. <laughs> but you will after you experience uh, today's first panel on public education. I assure you that the individuals that have agreed to serve on this panel have so much to impart to you about the past of our city, where we are presently, and where we hope to go. So I'm so encouraged by the um, interactions that we've already had earlier this morning, and I'm grateful that all of you are here, and hopefully more folks will come. So if you are tweeting, any tweeters out there, if you're tweeting, invite folks to come. Unfortunately, we will not be having our live stream today, but we will have the video up online probably within 24 to 48 hours of the full proceedings of the day. So are you guys ready to amplify Baltimore? Great. We're going to start like we always do with our wonderful partnership with the Wahlberg Project. I'm going to ask Ms. Pride to come up and talk about the video that the students did. This one is a little longish, but I'm sure really insightful because, you know, this is the area that they're probably most familiar with. Education, correct? So I'm going to let Ms. Pride come up and introduce the video, and then we'll see the short video, Public Education, through the eyes of the students of the Wahlberg Project. Ms. Pride. Good morning. How's everyone? Uh, my name is Felicia Pride, and I want to thank April for again inviting the Wahlberg Project here to um, int uh, further introduce or additional youth voices into the dialogue. The Wahlberg Project is a project that was launched off a community grant given to us by Ignite Baltimore. And basically, what we have done is uh, armed about 12 teens at the Wahlberg Library with little mini cameras, the flip cameras, to document their neighborhood. And this will culminate in a screening, a community screening at the library, the Walbrook Library, on April 7th. Um, but with April, she actually allowed us or invited us to provide the teens a platform to talk about the issues that are just going to be discussed today. So this first video is about education, and it had a lot to say about education. Uh, we had to cut it down, um, but I think it's very insightful, important insights into what they think about it. Do you like your school? It's okay. What's okay about it? Um. I mean, I like my school and everything, but it's just, just it'd be a lot of commotion going on. The whole thing about the uniform. Uh, I like it. What type of commotion? What do you mean? Fights. Fires. That was danger. That's who I What's okay about it? It's a regular school. They won't say more. Same thing you get with if you go to other high school. Fights, mm -hmm. yeah. teachers, people, classroom, sit there for hours, do nothing, sleep. Do the same thing. Doing nothing. So do you think you're getting a good education then? I mean, well, but I, see, I do all my work, so I don't really care. Not, not going to find too many people, teenagers our age, that like, they going to actually say they like getting up every day, five days a week going to school, in the same place, same routine, same people, the same rut. Right. Five days a week for like six, seven hours a day. So what do you like about it then? Uh, I just like, you know, the host. The people. See the people that I know. But I mean, the, the education is there regardless. You can learn it regardless. But after a while, it wears down on you. What about your teachers? Selective few. Yeah. Selective few? Yeah, he's not, not going to like all of them. It's certain classes that, that I love to go to the most. Like what? I like gym. That's the, that's the most fun class out of all. You got biology. That's fun. Um, I ain't too far with the math. But you got government, English. I mean, it's worth the while. So that's what I like. So you said the teachers, the select few. About those select few teachers, what do you like about them? Well, the ones in my school, they, it's not like they just come to school and they just have like a lesson plan. They just lecture all day. It's like more of a hands-on learning. It's not just like coming to 
comic school, like, teaching by a robot, it's like, hands-on and interactive, not just writing them boy, you copying, they had, like, PowerPoint slides and stuff going around the room, so Socratic seminars, debates, stuff that gets people, like, to actually want to come to school, like, oh, we don't have tomorrow, I'm going, but you don't hear that every day. Okay. What about, you said a select few, the teachers that you like, what do they do? They just, like, the teachers that I like, they just, they just try to be cool. To, they don't try to be like, oh, go to class, do, all, do this, do that. They don't be like bossy. They just touch you like they like they really know you for real. So they like don't. the relationship. Yeah, yeah something like that. The bond you have. Some teachers don't even want to come to school half the time. Some of them even don't come to school. They definitely don't. Because if, if we don't come to school, then it's a problem. If they don't come to school, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so it's like a, a example that's being said. Do you that, think that students are picking up on that? Some of them is. Yeah. Like, 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 like it's teachers, like in my school, it's teachers that like, constantly stay out like, days at a time. Coming, no type of no type of reason why they're out. Nobody say nothing to them. Because some of the students, they, 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 they do the same thing. They do. And we get substitutes. The substitutes. They don't, they don't teach. Yeah. They, they just they just sit there they and let the kids do that. That's us now learning. So when we get a test, I'm like, no, it's always before I take it. So what about graduation? Do you know a lot of people? Do, do you, does your school have a high graduation rate? My school has like a ten percent graduation rate. Really? Well, how do you how do you know that? The school, everybody in that said. So they talk about it openly. Yeah, the staff the staff say it all the time. So what do, do they say anything about what they're trying to do to improve the graduation rate? They don't work. They don't, the kids don't care. What is the relationship between getting the kids to care and the graduation rate? Well, in my school, um, it's about, I see about 5-10% that don't graduate. When you come in freshman year, it's a meeting in the auditorium. It start out about, I say, 300 in your class. And they tell you after a while, it gets it when they about to close it down. They tell you, look at the person next to you on both sides. Is that by the end of the school year, you graduate, they won't be there. So I come 11th grade, yeah, and you really think about it, it's people that you knew, some of them aren't there. But other than that, they make it, they, like you say, care. Well, in the city, I mean, if your grade drops to a certain point, you know, you get sent to a charter school, and then like, your 12th grade year, I mean, I think it's the end of your 11th or the beginning of your 12th grade, you got to apply to at least three four-year colleges. That's so, part of, that's a, a requirement? That's a requirement. So, so you think no, that helps to, for the graduation? That helps with the plan, the transition, so it's not like what you're doing after high school. I don't know. Uh, what about the administration at your school? Principals? <laughs> and, they're funny. <laughs> mm, well, they're funny. They're funny. Technically, we don't have a principal. What is it like a? We have a temporary principal. Uh, so what what is funny about them? <laughs> like more than intercoms, they just so dry. Yes. Talk so slow yeah, and, you, you know, and uh, like they just woke up. This is during the middle of the day, dude. Like, oh, yeah, like this happened and this happened. Morning and all <laughs> oh, like that's so dry. You got the same day. stuff every day. An hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> is that the same interest? No, it's like. My school, the administration, they, they play their favorites. Certain people can do whatever they want to do. Some others, they just can't. My school is one of the worst schools in Baltimore, right in Douglas. So, so nobody really cares for it. So you think no one cares? When you say no, no one, like who? Like the, the public. The public. So what do you think about education in general? Education in general. Well, is it important? Yes, it's important because you yeah. have to have it throughout life. Yeah. If you want a job, you have to know like math and stuff. And if you want to succeed in life, you gotta know like what you was taught. Well, I I haven't um I well I have I have seen how important education is recently to to students because of the the current um the money being taken. I think it's five hundred thousand. They um they they are like they fighting for the money the funds that they need to learn. And I didn't realize that how many people like actually care. So like half the school is actually going. And then like they having people having students in offices in the school on telephones calling legislators and they're debating back and forth.
with the, the legislators telling them to, how to leave the money there and whatnot. I mean, because that's what people say, that, you know, young people don't care about education. Do you agree, disagree? Some don't. There's more, there's more students than there's teachers, so. There's that are at this there. rally? Or that are? Yeah, it's mostly students. Is this mic live? Thank you. Can you give us a slide that says public education, please, on the PowerPoint? Thank you. Illuminating, right? What do you think? Or what they had to say? Let's shout it out. Candid. Powerful. Accurate. How did it make you feel? What was that, dear? Disappointing. Disappointed in whom? In the system? We have work to do. Anybody else? Frustrated? Frustrated? Well, guess what? That's why y'all are here. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce the great panelists that we have, and when I introduce you, I'm going to ask you to come to the stage. First, we have Dr. Walter Ampre. He is the former superintendent, the actual last superintendent by title of the Baltimore City Public School Systems. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, school board chairman Neil Duke will be unable to join us today. Next we have Jonathan Matthew Hornbeck, principal at Hampstead Hill Academy. Bobby McDonald, who is the executive director for the City Neighbors Foundation. Jack Pinnell, who is the founder of the Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys that will be opening in 2012. Dr. Sonia Brookins Santalisis, our wonderful CAO of the Baltimore City Public Schools. Kirk Sykes, principal at Carver Vocational Technical High School in Baltimore City. We have Jan Wagner, who is the executive director of the Central Scholarship Bureau. And I wanted you to point out the individuals who are in the front row. They are students, parents, and teachers from both Carver Vocational Technical High School and Hampstead Hill Elementary School, and we'll be hearing from them later. So we've been seeing so much in the news lately about public school education in Baltimore, both nationally and locally. We know that we have some battles in Annapolis that we're tending to. Um, we've heard the voices of some young people today in that particular video. You all, I'm sure some of you are parents, if not, you are involved in the lives of young people in this city. And I'm sure all of us have concerns about the state of public school education in Baltimore. I'm a native of this city, as many of you know. I'm a proud graduate of the Baltimore City Public School System. I went to Walter P. Carter Elementary School in Northeast Baltimore. It is now an elementary middle school. My middle school no longer exists. It was Winston Middle School. And I went to the Baltimore City College High School. I just had to say that extra emphasis, I have some poly friends in the audience. Um, and I went to school at a time where I didn't hear a lot of negativity about the school system. We had our challenges, yes, but I think people in our communities worked very powerfully um, on every level with whatever resources they had to make sure that public education was safe and accessible and that it worked. So my first question is to Dr. Ampre. You are a former school superintendent from 91 to 97, correct? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Is that mic on? Doesn't matter. I'm a big guy and I got a big voice. Big guy, big voice. <laughs> I have a cafeteria voice. So. Got a cafeteria voice. So, hypothetically, I am a 1982 graduate of Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. Notice that's a big hypothetical. I am African American male, 
went to Carnegie Mellon, got my MBA from Penn. I now work for T. Rowe Price. I live in the city. I have a couple of kids. They go to private school. The reason why my kids go to private school is because all I ever hear about Baltimore City Public Schools is what? Problems, violence, lack of any kind of real leadership. What happened to the school system that I went to that I felt very proud of, that I came out of, that I matriculated out of to go to a great school today? That's today. a question? Yeah, that's a, that's a question. Well, let me um, start off, first of all, April, by commending you the civic frame on um, what you're doing with some jobs in Baltimore. I'm a native of Baltimore as well. Born in Johns Hopkins, got one of my degrees there, and I love this city. I go to my grave loving this city. I travel. I get two vacations or two exciting trips because when I get to come home, I'm just excited. I wanted to make that point because when I saw that uh, video today, uh, there were, I had all the same feelings you all had. Somebody said you have a lot of work to do, and you do. But I also feel very hopeful. And in answering your question, I'd like to talk a little bit about, in a, in a second or so, what I think uh, is a great opportunity. Um, to answer your question, April, uh, there are myriad reasons why we are where we are and why people have attitudes that they do about their schools. And the attitudes really are accurate. Um, I grew up in a time when Baltimore City was the crown jewel of the state of Maryland. I remember a time when people in Baltimore County were lying about their addresses so that they could go to school in Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. I grew up at a time when Baltimore County only went to the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. I went to a time, to school at a time when, and grew up in a time when Edmondson High School was one of the finest schools that you could attend. Uh, we integrated Edmondson High School. It opened in 1957, so that gives you some idea of <laughs> how old I am. I said all that to say that the culture of Baltimore has declined. And we can find blame to put all over the place with regard to what has happened with that. But our youngsters reflect our broader community. That's not just true in Baltimore, it's true everywhere. So as a result of that decline in culture, we have also seen a Sisyphean effort on the part of the schools to try to overcome that and address it. So as that time has taken place, we've had parents and a culture within those families that was much more supportive and much more active with regard to schools. It was not a society or a community where you drop the kids off at five years old, like you're dropping off dry cleaning, and come back to get them 12 years later educated. Parents were much more involved in the education of their young people. That has changed. And it hasn't just changed economically. It's changed across the board where even affluent and well-to-do parents sometimes will choose not to be as involved as I think that they should. That's just a small part of why many people feel that they have given up on the public schools. But the hope is that, one, there are two things that are very important with regard to the successful education of a youngster. And all statistics seem to bear that out. One is the skill and ability of the first grade teacher. But the second, which is most important, is the involvement of the parent. So you will get the education for your youngsters to the extent that you're willing to invest in it and the time in it. I'm a product of the city schools, albeit a product at a time when that decline was beginning to take place. But I'm fortunate because my parents were involved, and I grew up in a two-parent household. That isn't the case now, so we have a responsibility. So I'll finish this long-winded answer to your question, April, by saying this is the kind of forum that must take place throughout our community in order to change that culture and to help what I think is a school system that is now beginning to do a great job to do even a better job. There are not a lot of people in this room, and that does not bother me one bit, because Margaret Mead said, never underestimate the ability of a small, determined group of people change the world. As a matter of fact, that's the only thing that does. I'll stop at this. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Santelisis, you have a huge job. <coughs> um, I think as 
people who are from Baltimore and people who reside in Baltimore, we hear so much about the talent at North Avenue. Um, we know that uh, yourself and um, Dr. Alonzo are extraordinarily gifted and skilled at what you do, and that you bring a breadth of knowledge about secondary education to Baltimore that we probably have not seen um, on a national scale, um, and you have resources that you apply here. I think, though, that a lot of folks in, in the city are sort of loosely aware of what you guys are doing but aren't really clear. So this I'd like for you to provide us with an opportunity to give the people of Baltimore an understanding of, like, really what is North Avenue up to? <laughs> and how is it that the people of Baltimore can assist you in doing what you're up to? Because I think we have an idea. We'll see an article here and there. We'll have a couple of conversations. If we know somebody who's kind of in North Avenue proper, we'll get an inkling here and there. But I think that there are a lot of folks who um, are in the city who don't really have a clue what the plan of action is and how they fit into that. So if you could give us a little synopsis on that, that would be great. Sure, and I thought I was going to get something hard. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> So, well, well, one of the, the things I, I do want to say is that, and I want to use this analogy because I think it's really important, and I don't know how many folks here followed the trajectory of the U.S. Olympic basketball team, right? And there was a time when the U.S. Olympic basketball team um, was assumed to be the best in the world because they had all these individual players from individual teams who were the stars, were individual stars in their own right. So I, I, I do get a little nervous, um, and maybe because I hear my grandmother's voice in the back of my head whenever somebody says you're gifted, make sure you realize you know, what comes with that and you get a little nervous about it. But, but part of why I refer to the US Olympic basketball team is because it took years, right, for the team of it, talented individuals who were just assumed that they were gonna go out on the court and wipe the world away in terms of gold medals and winning things. And really, frankly, to put it in just layman's term, they got their butts kicked, right? Because they assumed that just by having talented individuals, that was enough. Mm. When the U.S. Olympic basketball team actually st was when they got Coach K from Duke, right, to, to coach the team as a team. And I think that the that the litmus test for whatever it is that we're doing, which I'm fine talking about, and I want to remind everybody that, is that it's not about the individuals on the team. Mm -hmm. It is about the extent to which the individuals on the team work together to leverage right, the magnified impact right, that no single individual can have. So as gifted as Dr. Alonzo is, and that's part of the reason why, why I came to Baltimore City, but one of the things I tell people is, I didn't come to Baltimore City just for Dr. Alonzo. We were friends long before this, and I told him if I just wanted to see you more often, I could schedule four lunches a year, and we would be fine. Part of why I came to Baltimore City is because I think that there's a willingness in the city, there's a willingness among leadership at the district level, at the, at the school level certainly, for people to rethink the challenges as a team rather than isolated individuals. And so when we think about <clears throat> what the efforts are, part of what we have been doing, and I'll just, I won't do this as promo, but I would, I would encourage everyone around the city to keep your ears open um, for community meetings because that's one of the things we're trying to do is to get the word out around some of the, the, the work that we're doing. But most, in, I think the, the first shift was when Dr. Alonzo arrived, was a shift to giving uh, control back to schools to make the decisions that are closest to schools. And by doing that, to give families options. And that's one of the things that I think distinguishes Baltimore City. And this came up yesterday, and I was visiting a, a school, a high school, actually a charter school, and this was a, a new school leader who, irrespective of their role in the city, right, just as a parent, a new parent in the city was looking for schools. And what was great was it was just a parent-to-parent -parent conversation. It wasn't a CAO to principal conversation. And one of the great things that I left being re reinforced with is this idea that our work really is about providing great options. Because we don't believe that there's one single way for kids to get a great uh, education. That there, yes, there are things that are, are constant and consistent and things we need to work on, but this really is about making sure that families have options that match their families' needs and the individual children in their, 
in their family's needs. So that's number one, and I don't think that that's a, that that's a minor, you know, a minor issue. That, that's a big deal, especially in the age of kind of one size fits all. It's a big deal to be part of a city school system that believes that choice is a good thing. The piece that I will say about <clears throat> where I think the, the next phase of a lot of our work is centered around is really focusing on the experiences that students are having every day in the classroom and the relationship between students, the teachers, and the content. Because we can do the systemic work, which I think a lot of that has been done to create the conditions, right, for excellence, but the bottom line is, as parents, as grandparents, as students, which you heard from the young people on that tape, is that, that the bottom line is what do we experience every day, right? What's the kind of learning, right? What are the kinds of questions that students are allowed to ask? And one of the pieces that, um, that we've really been trying to, to focus on is this idea of what does real learning look like? And, and I get this from parents all the time, right? Because, you know, not a, the, the nice part about not being Dr. Alonzo is a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily recognize me. So, you know, I can go to the grocery store. <laughs> people don't really know who I am. And so I can, I can overhear conversations. I go to dance class. It took, like, halfway through the year. People are like, don't you work for city school? <laughs> so it, the, the great part is you, you hear how just everyday people are processing, right, a lot of what we're doing. And one of the things that I found um, <clears throat> being – all around the city that I've kept with me is, is that at the end of the day, um, parents, family members, young people want to know that the day-to-day -day experience that they're having is one, one of learning, two, being valued as individuals, right? So it's not this one size fits all for everybody because kids are different. And people want to make sure, of course, that their kids are safe, but they want to make sure that they understand what quality is. So one of my favorite things to do is to pepper um, parents with questions that they should ask their schools when they're looking for schools. So, and they kind of look at me funny, like, you really think I should, you know, aren't you the, and, and, but I tell them, I said, these are the questions. When you're looking for a school for your child, right, ask questions about what's the information? How do you know how well my child is doing? <clears throat> Right? How do you know how well my child is doing? And if the only answer that that school, that teacher, that principal can give you is, well, you know, we take the MSA every year, right, and we know that, then you need to ask more questions, right? And so part of the work in city schools now is how do we make sure that the same questions, right, I'm asking, we're asking, um, around what does this quality teaching and learning look like are the same questions that parents and family members should be asking. Because I think that's, that to me is the indicator of a strong system. Dr. Santelises, what I want to do with all of that that you've said yeah. is to, to ask you and to maybe challenge you a little bit. Please. To say how does that wonderful information get to these people and the greater community because I think there's a real disconnect between those of us who have the opportunity and who have the will to call you and have that conversation and the general public. I want to know what we can tell the people of Baltimore about what you're doing and how they can connect to that in a powerful way. I mean, one of the things that I've said to you and others in the past is if you ask folks in Baltimore where you went to school, what are they talking about? High school, right? And so you have this whole pool of, of social capital. It might turn into, you know, monetary capital, of, of things that, that we're not really tapping into as a city. And so I think there are a lot of us who are like, we want to help out the school system, but we're not sure how to enter into helping out maybe our alma mater or if I have an affinity for a school like Hampstead Hill or Carver. So what are the ways that you guys are kind of thinking, I, I love the redesign of the website, you know, so I think that that's part of it, but what are the ways in which you guys are really trying to connect what you're doing to the citizens of Baltimore who would like to become more active agents of change within the school system? So, I mean, there are a couple of ways that that's happening, but let me give you one example. Okay. So, <clears throat> we have made some recent moves around literacy. So, that's from a reading, writing, speaking in the district, right? And so, one of the things that we've been pushing a lot of schools on is, again, this question of how do you know how well kids are reading um, and what that means at each level of development, right? So, from kindergarten all the way up through 12th graders. And... So one of the pieces around that that was really important was we had a meeting with the city libraries 
to make sure that librarians knew some of the coding systems that we have for determining where a student is in their reading hmm. so that librarians are equipped with the same information so that when a family comes in, and you may not know the coding, and frankly, you know, nobody's paying you to know the coding, right? We should know what it means. <laughs> that a librarian is then equipped to be able to say to a family, you know, look, I'm coming in with this little code or this number of this description. How, how do I pick a book hmm. for my child, no matter what age they are? Um, the second way that we're doing that is beginning to translate a lot more of the kind of educationese, the official terms, in lay people terms, right? So my husband is not an educator, and he's my litmus test. So if I go spieling on and on and using all kinds of education, he's like, stop, just whoa. What is that? I don't know. And, and part of what that has pushed for, for us as a system is this idea that we have to translate what the educational standards are. So another example is the Common Core, right? It sounds like this big piece that's out there. One of, the, one of the ways that we're doing that, right, so we've had a couple community forums around the Common Core so that parents know what that is, community folks know, well, what's the difference between the Common Core and what I learned when I was in school. Um, we have schools, and I think you have examples of them here, that do a really good job in reaching out and making sure that their parent communities are, are informed in, again, very practical ways. But one of the things with the Common Core is we're already coming up with a guide for parents mm -hmm. by grade level so that community members, family members, right, a grandmother can pick up and say, okay, well, what does this mean for my middle school student who's in sixth grade? And what will be different, what should be different in terms of what I'm seeing in their sixth grade classroom. So those are some of the pieces okay. that, that we're putting in place in real tangible, tangible ways. Okay. Thank you so sure. much. I'm gonna go to the charter school folks. I wasn't gonna start with you guys, but I'm gonna start with you guys. <laughs> so why a charter school? Why choice? Why are options better than anything we've seen in the Baltimore City public school system before? And um, what makes your model more effective than the traditional model that we've seen? I'll start with you, Bobby. Okay. Um, so charter schools, of course, are public schools. And I would never say that they're better. But I would say that the value that they bring that I think is incredibly valuable is a place within the school system where parents or educators or community members and teachers can actually dream. Hmm. So there is a natural force in a system for compliance or for um, being able to systematize or move forward a whole group of many, many schools. And that's important and good and we need a strong system to do that. And I see you know, Dr. Alonzo and his team doing great work diversifying his portfolio of schools. But to have one place in that system where people can get together and say, what if we tried it like this? Hmm. Can we respond to the needs of these kids or these parents? For someone to have a great idea and to be able to make it come true <coughs> and to ask the people who are interested in that idea to come together and create together another vision of what public education can look like is so powerful and healthy for the public school system. And public education is a civil right. Hmm. We need to have fabulous, every single public school needs to be fabulous, but I agree with Dr. Santelisis that that doesn't mean one vision for what that can look like. Hmm. So from my perspective, the, um, the charter school law allowed me not only to take responsibility for public education, but it allowed me as an educator and a mama of three young children a chance to dream and gather folks who wanted to dream with me of another way it could be. And, um, and I think that's valuable for our entire school system, especially when the system itself embraces that and says, wow, if they're having great results over there, let's give the principals of our other schools and the parents and the teachers of our other schools more autonomy to be in that mindset of being able to make decisions and be responsive to the students and families they're serving. Can you tell me, because you've been in operation for a minute, can you tell me like your top three great results so that people are aware? Sure, so our school is um, based on project-based learning and arts integration, so it's a hands-on, we say how many ways can children express their knowledge, the hundred languages of children. So I just want to start with that. In terms of student achievement, 
the students do these presentations of learnings where they are able to stand up and review their own portfolio and say, here's what I learned in my different subject areas, here's what I would do differently, here's where I feel like I didn't try hard enough, and here are my plans for next year. Those are our student conferences by the end of the school year. And um, our first school, um, City Neighbors Charter School, is in its sixth year. Mm -hmm. So the students that have had experience with that year after year, the quality of those presentations has gone up each year. So I would say that in terms of student empowerment around their own learning and being self-conscious about that and taking ownership of that is something I'm most proud of. And then parent participation is, for us, um, the heart of our school. You know, our, our governance model is that the board of directors is mostly parents, teachers, students, the principal is on the board as well. So, um, you know, last year collectively our parents gave 14,000 hours of volunteer service. It's not just about showing up, and I know many people around this table know what I mean, and I think you do too. It's actually meaningful work. Our school does not run without the parents being involved. Mm -hmm. And so they have this ownership feeling as well. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing, and thank you for giving me a second to boast, that's very, <laughs> very nice of you. The third thing that I feel like we've got a, a way of um, providing and allowing an opportunity for is the teachers. So our teachers are together creating a, a moving and, and generative curriculum. So for example, the middle school um, teachers in our first founding school, City Neighbors, which is in a, new, a different phase because it's been there for six years, they looked at our math curriculum and said, you know, I just don't feel like this math curriculum is enough. Mm. We, f we see the weaknesses of the kids and we're mm. daily assessing, always assessing to move forward. We think it needs more. And the principal gathered them together and said, all right, what does it need? Are we talking about switching to another one? Should we supplement this? But that conversation, that year-long, in-depth conversation by the teachers about what was going to be happening and how it was going to be taught and how do we know they're learning. When you have a school and the teachers are passionately able to do their best work, I think that's a good thing for Baltimore City and for the children in Baltimore. Love it. Thank you. So, Yak, what will your school contribute and how will you complement the wonderful things that are happening in the Baltimore City Public School System? Um, first, thank you April. Thank you for, for putting together this forum and I'm the uh, founder of a school called, which will be called the Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. And I, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that we do have a system where people like myself and like Bobby can dream and envision a way to change education because obviously it seems to me very clearly from this film that something is an urgent need to be fixed. We saw these three boys, and I'm glad that there were boys, because that's, that's often not the case. And, and I wonder why these boys were, um, they were fairly articulate, <coughs> but I, 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 I watch these things and I see boys in the city, African American boys, boys of color, and, and I ask myself, are we preparing them for a world that is very competitive hmm. and that's potentially hostile to them? That's right. And, and I wonder, you know, then they sat there, and those boys, in my mind, were very eager for learning. And they were passively waiting for something to happen at their school. And for someone to start the school year, to say, look to your left and look to your right, and one of you won't be here, hmm. that begins at a, at a place of depression, at a place of, of pessimism, at a place of, well, you're not worth it. Hmm. And, and, and those kids get that message here. And so one thing with our school is that our message will, will be completely different. The FATS friends are very, are very pathetic when you, when you look at them, and it's not anyone's fault here, Dr. Ambrose or Dr. Santelisa's, is that when you look at nationally, 12% of black fourth grade boys were proficient in reading versus 38% of white fourth grade boys. That's a 26% gap in achievement. In Maryland in 2007, 2008, black males, 55% in eighth graders were, I mean, no, 55% black males were proficient in reading versus white males, 77%. I mean, these are graduation rates. So 55% of black males were graduating from high school and 77%, 77% of white males were graduating from high school. That's a 22% gap. In Baltimore City, it was 35% of black males versus 38% of white males. And, and that's, an interesting, that's an interesting number. We can go back and talk about that. And then finally, when you look at eighth grade reading nationally uh, and compare that to what happened in Maryland, 10% uh, of black boys are proficient, um, are proficient or above in reading versus 45% of white boys 
are proficient or above in reading. That's a 35% gap. So I look at that, I hear those, I hear those numbers, and I said, something is really amiss here. And it's about race, it's about, uh, 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 it's about social economic position. And our school will be focused on um, primarily boys of color, uh, primarily creating an, an institution that will have high expectations with maximum support for every child. And when you look at, at children spend about 10% of their life in school between kindergarten and uh, 12th grade. So that other 90% of the time is spent in the community, in the neighborhood, in a home that may be, be extremely dysfunctional, in parents who are, who are not educators themselves. <coughs> so our schools have now, I think, taken on an additional role of educating the whole child, which Bobby does very, very well. It's not enough just to just make sure that Jamal, and I'm picking that name deliberately, can read and, or, or, or that Jamal can uh, calculate in math. We also focused on Jamal's uh, intellectual, social, and moral well-being. We have to be we have to be concerned about that because a lot of that's not happening at home. It's not happening at home of poor families. Not and not have, happening at home of middle class families. And uh, and so school has to be completely concerned about that. So we have to build in, in my mind, high expectations, which means we will not tell a room full of 100 boys you're not going to be here. Instead, we're going to say every single boy sitting in this room today will graduate on time from this school, no matter what. And we will make sure the parents know that, the guardians know that, the community knows that, and everyone knows that. It has to have this sense of urgency, because the, the more that we let these children just slip through the cracks, and I'll just shut up and say one thing. I have a vision. There's a fast train. And there's a train that says, depending on what neighborhood you're, you're, born, on, you're born in this city, that train is heading to prison, mm -hmm. that train is headed to uh, a, a, a deep dependency on government services, mm -hmm. and that train is headed to poor health outcomes, that we're, we as people are going to pay for that. And, and my, my job is to yank kids, boys, off that train and put them on a train that takes them to some place where they can be productive citizens in society. Mm. And when our state spends $27,000 to incarcerate most African American boys between the ages of 18 and 34, and we're spending somewhere between nine and $12,000 to educate mm -hmm. our children, mm -hmm. to me, for the capitalists and everyone else, the facts are very clear. Let's invest more in education, but smartly in education so that we can um, reinvent and create a better educational opportunity. Thank you. So I, I, I have to admit, uh, you know, personally that I picked everybody on this panel for a reason. Um, <laughs> and God gave me that vision to do so. The, the next three I have a personal connection to. I am extraordinarily biased about them. Um, Matt Hornback and Kirk Sykes are principals at two incredible schools in Baltimore City. Um, Matt is K through eight at this point, and Kirk is at Carver Vocational Technical High School, which is my mom's school. Um, and Jan Wagner, who you'll hear after um, they speak, um, <coughs> is in charge of an organization that gives interest fee loans to students who are pursuing college. And the reason why I'm putting them all together is because, as many of you may or may not know, when I was in the second grade, my second grade teacher at Walter B. Carter Elementary School had a parent-teacher conference with my mom, and I was present. And she said, you know, your daughter's slow. She's just going to be slow, so we're going to have to move her to another track next year. And, you know, my mom didn't black out, and she can black out. But um, <laughs> I love you, Mom. <laughs> um, but what she did was that summer she made me read everything, every cereal box, every stop sign, everything in the market. I mean, it, she, it was intense. And, of course, the next year I was in Gifted and Talented with Miss Burkett. Um, you always remember your favorite teachers, and I have many of them. Um, and the reason why I share that story with you is because my mom did not finish Carver. She left in the 11th grade, and she got a GED. Um, my biological father never finished high school. Um, and retired as a janitor. And um, I keep hearing all of this stuff about, well, you know, the pathology of people in these areas means that their kids are going to look like this. So not only do I not look like that, and not only was that due in part to my family and my mom and some other people, there are a lot of people in this room, 
a lot of people in this room, a lot of people who write checks, a lot of people who pray, and a lot of people on this stage that had everything to do with the fact that I did not become a statistic. And it started in elementary, middle school, and it went on to, you know, high school, and it went on to Jan and folks at her organization saying this kid has a chance to make it out of Baltimore and to do something great, and so we're going to give her some money. So I want the two of you, Matt and Kirk, to talk a little bit about how is, you know, elementary, middle school education a little bit different from when we all attended? What's so great about it? Um, what was so great about what we did? and not so great about what we did back in the day that we didn't know about, and what are your challenges, but also more importantly, what are the things that we can build on? Because I know I've been to both of these campuses. I've been you know, lucky enough to actually go and, and watch what they do for a day. You know, I want you to kind of do some comparison between what we experienced then back when your dad was a superintendent of Maryland Public Schools, frankly, and what you're seeing now and what some of the challenges are, but what the hopes are in those two areas. So, April, thanks for, as everyone said, for organizing today. Um, Hampstead Hill is a wonderful place, and I'm grateful to have um, Ms. Mendoza, a second grade teacher, and Ms. Freeman, an ESOL teacher, and uh, lots of kids and parents with me today um, to represent the school. Uh, I hope we can hear from them maybe yes, in, a, in a little while. Um, Jack said something that reminded me that um, uh, there's a, there's a for-profit um, uh, company called Wacken Hut that builds prisons and what they look at to determine the number of beds they're going to need in 10 years is um, uh, uh, second or third grade literacy rates and they can decide how many beds they're going to need and um, what a sad commentary on uh, America not just Baltimore but where we are when that is such an accurate predictor set aside the money that's spent on on uh, those beds versus um, what a quality education would uh, would would look like um, there were 160,000 students in Baltimore City when I was a student at Thomas Jefferson and West Baltimore Middle and City College, and there were 110,000 students in the district when I started teaching at Hartford Heights Elementary School when Dr. Amprey was the superintendent, and there are uh, 84,000 students today. Hmm. And 84,000 uh, students is actually two or 3,000 more than a couple of years ago, which is uh, another a uh, bright spot in this conversation where uh, Dr. Alonzo and uh, a huge team of folk that have um, been uh, um, working for, for these past four years um, have turned the tide on 40 years of declining enrollment and have brought parents back. I think that uh, Michael Sarbane's uh, communications office and all of the school family councils that exist to um, advise schools and on budget and, and, and other issues have um, really engaged the community in ways that um, is uh, refreshing for, for Baltimore and an urban district and um, just so needed. Um, I think that our, uh, I'm sure Kirk and I have a lot of common ground. We're pre-K through eighth grade. We've got 620 kids. Um, we're one of the most diverse schools in the city. We've got about 40% white, 30% Hispanic, and 30% African American. Um, population with uh, significant Native American and Asian populations as well. And um, uh, we have a wonderful, uh, vibrant um, community and, and lots of what people think of as extras like um, uh, chess and, and debate and food and organic uh, garden club and community dinners and phys ed and art and all of these things. Um, but the number one thing that really matters and the thing that um, Dr. Santelisis had a, a professor from Harvard come speak to principals last summer, um, uh, Dr. Richard Elmore, and um, he made a point of saying that um, it, it matters twice as much which teacher you have if you're a student uh, versus which school you attend. And uh, parents know that, and um, uh, that's why they request specific teachers. <laughs> when, um, and uh, principals know that. And, um, uh, it is critically important for principals to attract and retain and support um, top teachers because uh, that's the whole game. And, um, uh, and to counsel out folks who need to find another job and um, to really uh, find the people who um, are going to get the work done. Mm. So um, uh, that's, that, that effectiveness issue is um, a, a huge piece of the work. We're a hybrid at Hampstead Hill where um, we are a public charter school, but we are a zoned school. There's been a school in the city block for over 100 years. 
and um, uh, we accept everyone within that zone. And then if there are additional spaces available, those go by lottery. Um, and uh, I would say that um, a sort of transparent openness to the work is really important so that you have a sense that your parents and your students are your customers and that um, uh, that's been uh, driven home again by work at the central office because um, I think that fair student funding where the dollars follow the kid results in some uh, ready-made accountability where we're going out there making sure we keep our enrollment where it needs to be and recruiting kids and families. <coughs> and um, that's a different message in these last few years than schools have had. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'll, I'll stop there and Kurt. Uh, and Kirk, I want you to also, I, I chose you specifically because of the vocational mm -hmm. aspect of, of what your charge is as an institution in a city where a lot of those opportunities might be waning um, to talk about how our, our job market has changed and what the challenges are with you connecting your students to viable opportunities for future um, economic and professional growth as well. Sure. Um, and thank you again for, for having me. Um, I want to go back to the video because I, I thought it was very powerful to see sort of um, how students are reacting to their experiences. Yes. And, I, and I, quite frankly, I wanted to just invite them to Carver. You know, I wanted to see if you can transfer now because I think that we have <coughs> a, a wonderful opportunity at Carver um, being a Votech school. Um, we offer 11 career pathways, everything from the service trades of child care, culinary arts, and cosmetology on through the more technical trades of Cisco and CAD. Um, um, and then we have the, our traditional construction trades, electrical construction, uh, carpentry, masonry, uh, and electrical wiring. But um, again, you know, I read a book about 10 years ago um, by Ted Sizer called The Students Are Watching. Mm -hmm. And clearly from that video, you mm -hmm. see that they are. And um, it, it really resonated with me because imagery is very, very important to our young people who are bombarded with <coughs> negative images. So at Carver, you know, we've made a really deliberate attempt to change the culture into an open door culture, not in a traditional sense where you can walk into the principal's office, but in a, in a sense where the classroom doors are open. And, you know, when I, I remember when I came to Carver, partly it was the doors were closed because we were under construction and there was a lot going <laughs> on. Um, but after, you know, we had gone through phases and the building began to uh, uh, appear much differently, the doors remained closed. And that was an important message to me as a principal because it, it let me know that there were some climate issues that needed immediate attention because we wanted to have the type of school where you could walk down and not only hear the teaching, but hear the learning. And, you know, to Dr. Santelich's point, er, and to your point as well, Matt, everything, well, the most important things that matter are what the alchemy between teacher and student, what's happening in those classrooms. And I want, you know, parents, when they come into the building, to sort of be wild by what they see, a, a sense of security. Because the parents are very guarded and very defensive, um, because they have been impacted by the images that are happening out uh, uh, in, in the society. And so they have a very um, jaded image of schools. They walk in, uh, they're not always handled uh, properly uh, in, in, in the main office and things like that. So we pay a lot of attention to those subtleties so that we can impress parents, so that we can have them feeling comfortable with sending their kids there. And then once their kids are there, we really, uh, uh, monitor very closely the quality of instruction that they're receiving, whether it's through their CTE programs or whether it's through one of the uh, mess subjects, the math, English, science, and social studies. That's what it's about. Um, I think at times we have made schools a little more complicated than they ought to be. Um, if you, as a visitor, when you talk about what folk can do, they need to show up, and it takes a while of course, to build relationships with our young people, they don't uh, trust you right off the break, right? And because many of them have had experiences with adults that have let them down. And so, you know, we have, we, we sort of talk about this at Carver amongst the teachers and amongst the administrative team about what ways can we 
re-engage our young people in a way that's going to change behavior, <coughs> in a way that's going to make them take ownership of their learning, in a way that's going to restore a uh, sense of hopefulness in them. And these young people that we saw in, in, in the film earlier um, clearly have some, 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 some work to do in that regard. And so again, at Carver, we are really, really committed to making sure that the quality of the experiences, uh, whether it's a kid who wants to go on to college or a kid who wants to delay college and go into the world of work right away, we want to make sure it's a top-notch experience. Yep. Jan, um, I'm a little misty. There would be no Kenyon, no Columbia, no Harvard without you. So I'll thank you again. You're welcome. And um, I want you to talk to us about, over time, what you've, you've seen. You said you've been in existence for 72 years? We've been in existence since 1924. Wow. So over the time, well, clearly you weren't present for all of that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but over the time that you have been there, um, what are the different needs you're seeing in the students who are applying for funding from your organization? And also talk about the successes, what you found. And another question that I, I would I just, it just occurred to me, how many of those students are you seeing returning back to Baltimore to make an impact on the city? I wish I, one day I'm going to be able to answer all, all of those questions, <laughs> particularly it. in terms of the number of students returning, but um, uh, we're just starting our, our data process where we'll be able to, to talk about things like that. I wanted to say one thing though, April. Things have changed a little bit since you came to Central Scholarship for Help in 1988. We still have our loan program. Uh, we have about $3 million in loan funds serving about 500 students at any point in time. But five or six years ago, our board recognized that the needs of our students are changing, and there was so much loan money out there. The reality was you could, almost anyone could go out and borrow any amount of money and go to college. And so we started fundraising for grants. And last year, we awarded 1.1 million. 800,000 of that was grants that do not have to be repaid, and $300,000 was part of our was part of our loan program. So, um, to answer your question about some of the changes that that we're seeing uh, and the things that we're concerned about, um, it's sort of an accepted fact that it's going to take five or six years to get through college. And this is of concern to us because we've always been about money and about affordability. And if you look at the cost of taking five or six years, it's really extraordinary. It's not just the additional cost for those two years, but it's also the lost income. Mm -hmm. Because if you had finished in four years, you would be out and you would be working. Right. And so there's a lot of concern. I, I think I don't uh, want to sound too critical, but I, I, th I think that the universities are not as in tune with this as they need to be. When the students come to us, they've already been accepted. Mm -hmm. and. We rely on the colleges and their admissions department. When they admit a student, then we, they're saying to that student, we've looked at your grades, we've looked at your records, and we believe that you are capable of completing our program. Right. And so we think there has to be some obligation on the part of the universities. Once they've admitted these students, that there are supports in place that are going to assist them in completing, and, but also completing in four years. I mean, we see kids all the time who complete in four years. And uh, money is a huge piece of it. We know that. We, we have done enough research on our students to know that most of them do finish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but that money is really a crucial piece. Thank you. We're going to go to, and I know Dr. Amper, you have to leave. He's celebrating 100 years of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> and I am very proud of him for that. He's been in major leadership positions, so let's give him a hand. He's been a national uh, a leader in that organization, and they have a special, um, they're honoring uh, one of their founders who's actually interned at Mount Auburn Cemetery, which is literally across the street from my grandmother's house in Westport. So. Um, if, yes, you may make a, a quick comment, and then we're going to go to the teachers and the parents. I know that you all are going to now have an opportunity to um, ask some questions, and I think that's very important. I wanted to leave you with some hope, and I'll be very brief. But there are some things that are happening overall that I think we ought to just kind of keep our eye on. Sometimes we're in a city, in a local place. We can become somewhat myopic. I've been blessed because I was forced to retire in 1997. The governance <laughs> changed. That was a nice way of getting fired. They, they said they said. But it forced me, because of my life's work with changing what happened with kids, 
to look beyond Baltimore to try to figure out how I was going to make a difference. So I ended up working all over the country now, and my consulting firm is all over the place. So I spent hours and hours looking at what's happening and talking with many, many people all over the country. And there are some things that I think you ought to just kind of be aware of. One, education is on the front burner in this country. You can't find an article now that isn't written about education, and that's a good thing. We're paying much, much more attention to it. We've still got some work to do to figure out how it will all come together, but it's happening. I know people are critical of what's happening in Baltimore, and I've had many, many successors since I was here, but from what I can read and see from a distance, things are beginning to turn around. That's another piece of hope. I was in Houston on Monday and Tuesday at the American Productivity and Quality Center. I won't tell you a whole lot about it now, except I think that it's a, it's a nonprofit, but it has changed every aspect of America over the past 50 years, but not education. In the past five years, APQC now has gone into education as a nonprofit and has begun to make a difference in school systems using a process approach which doesn't mean that you have to change all that you're doing. I just want to mention that because you'll hear more about it, and I think you'll get excited about it. There's some places where it's already happened. It happened in Montgomery County over the past three or four years. So I wanted to tell you that I think that education is on the front burner. I think things are becoming very positive, and I don't want you to get as depressed and as gloomed about some of the things that we hear and to recognize that on a broader picture, um, as we say, the children are our future. Well, right now we are their future, and I think we're turning things around. Thanks an awful lot. Thank you.